Hi, thanks everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Venditti. Uh, I am one of the two organizers of the session together with uh, uh, Jorgo Georgiadis from the European Central Bank. The session is below us in a low or long environment. So thanks for uh, being here to the speakers and also to the attendees. We have four papers in the session. Uh, one is US Banks and Global Liquidity by Ricardo Correa from the Federal Reserve Board. Then we have a paper on optimal monetary policy and the dollar price by Konstantin Egor of New Economic School. Uh, the paper Risk Uncertainty and Monetary Policy in, in a Global World by Marie Oerova, European Central Bank. And then we will close with uh, uh, Etienne Le, Le Père, perhaps, from the ECD. Correct me if I'm wrong with the pronunciation of your surname, Etienne. Capital flow deflection under the magnifying glass. glass. Um, bigger, so let me start uh, uh, directly with uh, Ricardo. Ricardo, can you share your screen? Uh, and uh, you can start your presentation on US global banks and global liquidity. I'll give you the time uh, at. Uh, when you have 15 minutes left and then when you have uh, five minutes left. So uh, first, uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting us to present uh, this paper. This is joint work with uh, uh, Wen Chin Du, who's at Chicago, and Gordon Leo, who's uh, also at the Federal Reserve Board. Of course, uh, we have to give you the usual disclaimer. These are our views and they do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, or the Federal Reserve System. So let me let me start with a brief overview of the paper. I think this this paper uh, matches well with a nice panel discussion that uh, we had yesterday on uh, on the role of different currencies uh, around the world and the uh, and the role of the of the dollar as uh, one of the major reserve currencies. So as the panelists discussed yesterday one of the major um, advantages that the dollar has is that it's used in, 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 in many transactions uh, around the world. And of course, to be used in, in those transactions, we need uh, for intermediaries to be able to distribute those dollars uh, globally. So what we do in this paper is to look at the plumbing of a, or a, a particular part of the plumbing of the uh, of the dollar center around a uh, U.S. banks. Uh, why U.S. banks? Because uh, we think that the uh, U.S. banks are the natural uh, suppliers of dollars because they have access to a big set of uh, retail deposits uh, or uh, stable funding sources that they can then deploy uh, to provide a uh, liquidity in different in different markets. So uh, as, as, as I noted in the slide, uh, one of the, or the main question is how do global banks, or in this case, US global banks, inter intermediate dollar funding, especially during uh, funding shortages, because that's when uh, those dollars are, are needed the most. And in the process, we document, document a new part of, a, of a intermediation strategy. And this uh, became a common, after the global financial crisis, when the Federal Reserve ha a, had a, a, a big balance sheet and a, a lot of reserves. So what these banks uh, were doing uh, were, was what they, we call reserve-based intermediation. And I'll, I'll come back to this in, in, in a couple of slides uh, to explain it with, with graphs, how this reserve-based intermediation works. Uh, one of the critical things about this reserve-based intermediation is that there are a lot of uh, transactions within the banking organization because uh, at least in the United States, the, within a bank holding company, the commercial bank is the one that holds the reserves at the Federal Reserve Board. So they're the ones that have access to the, uh, uh, to the interest and access reserve window, for example. Uh, but uh, within the same umbrella, you also have broker dealers that transact in, in, in different markets. So. Uh, to, for this reserve-based intermediation to take place, we need a lot of interactions between the commercial bank that has the reserves and the broker dealers that intermediate dollars in, in these other markets. So I'll, I'll come back to this, uh, but this is the, the type of uh, intermediation or plumbing that we're trying to discuss in this paper. We focus on, on three type of uh, funding shortages. Uh, that they became uh, important in this uh, post uh, GFC period. The first one is a uh, quarter ends uh, during quarter ends because of uh, regulatory uh, rec uh, because of the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, by, by the nature of regulatory constraints, uh, some banks pull out of the markets, uh, of some markets, because they have to report their leverage ratio. So to make their balance sheets look uh, smaller, they pull out from these markets, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, in this case, dollar gives, uh, dollars become uh, 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 scarce, and uh, as we document, we see a, a spike in, in different uh, intermediation spreads uh, during, this, uh, during this period. Then we have the Treasury General Account, which is sort of like the, the checking account of the US government. Uh, when the Treasury General Account, uh, in, when the balance of that account increases, that means that there's less uh, reserves or there are less, uh, uh, there are less, less funds for the financial sector. So that's another types of, 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 of funding shortage. The third one is the, the of course, the, the Fed SEMA, SEMA portfolio. So when the, when the, when the Fed uh, uh, buys securities, that increases uh, uh, funding in the, in the markets. But when, when you have the opposite, which is when, when there's a normalization period or a, a QE taper, you're going to see the opposite. Uh, uh, um, uh, reserves go down because the first uh, the Fed starts uh, selling out uh, some of the uh, of the portfolio of securities that they have, or they they, they don't uh, reinvest uh, those uh, uh, that, that that portfolio. Now, what do the U.S. banks do? So, what we find in the paper is that uh, they uh, inter intervene in, in in two particular markets during these uh, funding shortages, and these markets. Uh, or, or this type of transactions are the ones that we call scalable because they're the ones that the banks can adjust on a high frequency basis. So they, uh, when the, the funding shortages happens, they lend more in the repo markets uh, via reverse repos, and then uh, they or net reverse repos, and then they lend more in FX swap markets. So to do this, of course, we need the granular data. And uh, one of the uh, data sets that we're using is a novel database that uh, uh, collects information or balance sheet information for banks on a daily basis. So to do a lot of this high frequency analysis, of course, we need uh, balance sheet information at, at, at high frequency. So here, uh, this uh, database called, uh, or this uh, report called the FR 2052A uh, was uh, implemented uh, after the global financial crisis uh, to comply uh, or, or to get information uh, on, on banks compliance with the liquidity coverage ratio. So we get a uh, daily information about assets and liabilities of these banks. Uh, the interesting thing is that we get uh, this information at the consolidated basis, but also by currency and by material subsidiary. So we can see transactions within the banking organization and we can also see how dispositions uh, of assets and liabilities uh, change in different currencies. So I think that this is one of the, of, 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 uh, the, the important contributions of our paper. We're using this database that's, uh, that's, um, that provides us information about uh, an aspect that has, uh, has been uh, scantily discussed. Our sample period, uh, it's uh, between December tw uh, 2015 and May 2020. Uh, we cannot go further back because these data started uh, to be collected on a daily basis in 2015. There's information before that, but it's not at a, on a, at a daily frequency. And if we focus on six of the uh, US GSIP, of the eight US GSIPs, Bank of America, Citigroup, uh, Goldman Sachs, AP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo, we exclude uh, State Street and Bank of New York Mellon because they have a uh, different uh, business models. So they, they, they're more, more, more of custodian banks and they, their model, their business model is not a, <clears throat> as, as homogeneous with the other banks that we have in the, in the, in the sample uh, as we would like. So let me uh, start by, by briefly discussing uh, the types of a, a intermediation a, um, a, uh, activities that these banks conduct at high frequency. So, in general, I mean, when you when you, when you think about a, a bank's balance sheet, I mean, you think about lending and deposits. But at high frequency, those things don't change uh, very rapidly. They're not scalable. 
So when, when we, and in the paper, we have a, a very nice a graph with all the components of the bank's balance sheets on a daily basis. And we see that the two components that are scalable are the repo, a, a repo lending and, and, the, and the FX swap lending, which I'm gonna discuss in a second. So just a refresher, a, a repo transaction is basically a collateralized a loan so in this case, in, in at period T, JP Morgan provides a dollar to, to a, a US dollar borrower, and in return, they get collateral. And then T plus one, that transaction unwinds. So the collateral goes the other way, JP Morgan returns the collateral to the US dollar borrower, and then the, the money returns back to, or the cash returns back to JP Morgan. And, and we captured this, uh, this type of scalable transactions by, by looking at uh, the reverse repo and the repo positions of this bank. And the, the difference between the two is the net repo position of the, of the bank. Now, the second, the second one is a bit more complicated. Uh, this is lending in the FX swap market, but you can think of, uh, about it as a collateralized transaction, but it's, instead of, if, of the bank receiving a security, what the bank is gonna receive is, is currency. So, in this stylized uh, example, JP Morgan uh, lends dollars in the FX swap market, uh, and in return, they get yen. And then what they do with those yen is that they, they either park that money at the Bank of Japan through a, an affiliate in, in, in Japan, or they lend uh, that money to a, a borrowers that wants a, a, or that needs a Japanese yen. Then at T plus one, the transaction unwinds. So the, 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 dollar, the dollar goes uh, in the opposite direction. So the dollar returns, the dollars return to JP Morgan, and then the yen goes back to the, to the USD borrower. And, 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 and of course the balance at the Bank of Japan that JP Morgan has decreases. Now, the, the, the tricky part about this FX, uh, trans FX uh, swap transactions is that they're off balance sheet and we don't have good, good, good uh, information about this off balance sheet transactions. So one of, the, one of the things that we do is that given that we know that this is how the banks operate, uh, we try to uh, capture this FX swap lending through a, a on balance sheet transactions that we know are highly correlated with this FX swap um, lending. So as, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, basically, uh, we measure um, short-term FX swap lending by uh, adding up foreign currency excess reserves uh, plus net uh, uh, reverse repo transactions in foreign currency. Uh, and we do a few robustness checks uh, with other measures, uh, and, and they give us more or less the same. 13 minutes so, left, Ricardo. Perfect, fantastic. So. Uh, so how do the how, how do the banks uh, finance this uh, FX swap lending and and and, and repo transactions? Uh, there are two ways of doing this. One is a match book intermediation, and the other one is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, reserve draining. So this is a this is a very stylized uh, balance sheet for a for a bank holding company. So on the uh, on the liability side, you have deposits and repo. On the asset side, you have a, either a reserves, or in this case, rainable reserves, a reverse repo, and FX lending. So at time zero, uh, the bank has this structure. Now, if they want to lend more in a match book transaction, they basically borrow more in the repo market, and then they lend more with those funds. They lend more in the reverse, uh, uh, through reverse repo or through FX lending. Uh, one of the uh, important implications of this match transaction is that the balance sheet grows. So the bank may be constrained because of a uh, leverage uh, requirements uh, or, 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 any, or, or any requirements that, that impose uh, uh, some limitations on the size of, of these banks. The second, uh, the second option is to do what we call this reserve draining. And, and for the bank, one of these uh, advantages is that the balance sheet doesn't change. So basically what we see in the reserve training uh, transaction is that the banks are substituting uh, assets. So they're substituting uh, renewable reserves for either reserve repo, reverse repo uh, lending or FX lending. So there's a, a substitution from, 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 from one type of asset to another type of asset. The balance sheet doesn't change. 
they're just changing the composition of the of the of the asset side of the balance sheet. Again, I mean, in this case, one of the advantages is that the balance sheet doesn't increase. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, a depository institute, the depository institution within the bank is the one that has the reserves, a, but the broker dealer is a, the one that does the FX lending and the, and the repo transactions. So what, for this to happen, we're going to have that the, there has to be a transaction be, within the banking organization that we can document with our data. So what we observe is that uh, there's a, some internal repo between the depository institution and the broker dealer. So the 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 the, the depository institution uh, lowers down their levels of reserves, and they lend uh, those funds uh, to the to the broker dealer, and in turn, that broker dealer is able to maintain its lending in the reverse in the repo market or uh, to provide FX lending. So next, let's, let's talk about prices. So bank intervene in this uh, in these markets or during during these funding shortages because they get paid to do that, right? So here I'm going to show you a little bit about what are the intermediation spreads that the banks get if they intervene in those particular uh, funding shortage situations. So. There are three types of uh, spreads that are relevant. The GCF um, tri-party repo spread. This is the, the spread that the, that the banks gain for doing this match book transaction. So GCF is the rate that they get by lending in the uh, reverse repo market. And the tri-party repo spread is the, uh, the tri-party repo uh, rate is the one that they typically pay when they borrow in the, in the repo market. Then you have the GCF IOR spread. That's basically the, the spread that they gain if they do this reserve draining transaction. So the IO, uh, IOR is what they 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 don't uh, that they they, they don't um, gain by 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 by, ha by by what they could gain by having the reserves at the Federal Reserve, and the GCF rate is what they they, they gain by lending in the in the in the in the rever in the repo market. And then they, you have the FX IOR uh, basis, which is basically what uh, they can gain by lending in the FX swap uh, dollar market. In this case, we're showing uh, the FX uh, IOR basis uh, relative to the to the euro. And as as you can see, there are a bunch of spikes, and these spikes are typically associated with some of the short dollar short, short shortages that we um, that I mentioned earlier. And one of the uh, most common one is a quarter end. So if you can see the, 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 the dashed vertical lines, those are quarter ends. And you see the spikes in, the, in some of these uh, rates during the quarter end, especially uh, in the FX swap market. So uh, let's, let, let's try to see how banks intervene when these uh, funding shortages occur and they are able to gain this, uh, this uh, intermediation spreads. So here we're going to focus on, on quarter ends first. So this, this is the, like the aggregate uh, balance sheet for the six banks. And this is what happens to some of the important categories uh, at, at quarter ends. So as you can see on the, on the, on the, on the, on the top right, uh, the banks uh, maintain the, the, the reverse repo lending. So they continue to lend at quarter end. So this is zero is quarter end. And then the, 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 the window around it is uh, 10 days before and after a quarter end. So they maintain reserve repo lending, but uh, they decrease the repo borrowing in the bottom left. And they increase FX swap lending. So how do they finance this? So if they're not borrowing uh, more in the repo market, how do they finance this? Uh, as we see in the top left, they decrease the level of reserves uh, in the bank holding company. So this is what we call a reserve trading intermediation. The, the, there's a, a shift in the composition of assets, a reserves go down and a net, net reverse a repos go up and FX swap lending goes up. So that's what happens typically at quarter ends. And this is how the plumbing works. So this is how this bank can conduct in this intermediation. So what, there's one piece of the puzzle that is missing which is uh, we want to document uh, how do these banks move uh, funding from the commercial bank to the broker dealer. And here, what we have on the left is uh, 
uh, is uh, the uh, broker dealers external repo borrowing. So as we can see, uh, and as we saw before, external repo borrowing decreases. So they, they, they borrow less from uh, third parties. But on the right-hand side, we find that they borrow more internally. And a lot of this comes from the commercial bank, uh, which is the one that holds the reserves and the ones that uh, would uh, decrease that overall level of reserves for the, uh, uh, the, the, the financial uh, or the bank holding company. So uh, they can do this, but of course there are limits to these transactions. Uh, uh, if the transaction is st are structured in a way that there's no credit risk, that this is not gonna hit a, uh, regulations that uh, limit the transactions between broker dealers and, and depository institutions, but you can still have a, a resolution planning rules that could limit these transactions because banks have to keep liquidity in their different uh, material entities. And so uh, that may prevent the commercial bank, for example, to send in some of its liquid assets to the broker dealer. So they can do this, but there are limits to this type of intermediation within the banking uh, holding company. Now the second type Five of- Five minutes, uh, Ricardo. Fantastic. Five minutes, thanks. So the, the second uh, type of uh, shortage is the, is the uh, increase in the TGA, uh, uh, the Treasury, Treasury General Account uh, uh, um, uh, balance. So when, when this uh, account balance increase, uh, that drains reserves from the system and we should expect an increase in, 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 in rates, uh, in repo rates. And that's uh, basically what we observe here. The positive slope tells us that if the, if the Treasury general account increases, uh, uh, you're gonna see an increase in, in, in repo rates. And in some cases, we're gonna have a, a extreme increases like what happened last September uh, when the, there was a big repo spike on September 17. So how does the uh, how does the how do the banks react to these uh, changes in the TGA? They react in the same way as they do for quarter ends. Reserves go down, net re net re reserve, reverse repos uh, increase in column four, and FX lending increases in, in column five. So we see the same pattern. This is how these banks are intervening, and we we see the same thing for the for the summer uh, uh, switches, but it's le a bit less significant. But remember that the, in this case, the, 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 the SOMA coefficient should be uh, the opposite than, than the others. Because an increase in the SOMA, a portfolio means more reserves. So, uh, so we see that uh, both for quarter ends, TGA and SOMA, we see sort of more or less the same pattern that we observed before. Uh, so let me uh, very briefly, like uh, I'm gonna give you a one minute uh, discussion of what happened during uh, the September 2019 funding market events which is an extreme case of what we have been discussing so far. So here, there's, there, there, there's uh, information about uh, FX, uh, uh, FX uh, lending uh, spreads and GC repo uh, rates uh, around that time. As you can see, there was a big spike in, in, in both, uh, in both uh, rates uh, in, in September 17th, which led to an intervention by the Federal Reserve uh, through a more, uh, by providing more funding in, in, in these markets. So the question is, did the U.S. banks uh, behave differently at this, uh, at this particular juncture? And we find that in September 16th, they didn't, be, they didn't behave very differently. The reserves went down. And so this, is, this, uh, uh, this uh, range is tell, tells you what's the typical rate, range of intervention uh, for these banks during fund shortages. So you can see that uh, all the all the all the items or all the all the all the transactions are more or less within the range uh, that they, where they normally intervene. Uh, so there was not nothing unusual. However, if we if we look at uh, the reserve draining by different types, both the U.S. GCs, foreign banks, and other banks, we do observe that the foreign banks did drain less reserves. If they're doing the same as the U.S. banks what we find is that they drain the reserves by less. So they uh, 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 probably provided less funding in this market. I mean, this is not a, a smoking gun uh, to what happened, but this could be one of the contributing factors for, to that repo spike. And uh, 
Uh, and one of the uh, factors that led to this episode in September was that the uh, overall level of reserves uh, for uh, U.S. domestic banks, uh, foreign banks, and the last U.S. GSIPs were was at, at multi-year lows. So these are the reserves that the total reserves that the bank that the, the banking system had uh, in the vertical line in September 16, uh, 2018. So as you can see, there was a decrease in reserves that led to this particular point. And uh, of course, that led uh, to the Federal Reserve intervening in this market by providing uh, funding through a, a, a repo facility. And, and, as, uh, and, and those that, that uh, repo borrowing from the Fed is, is shown in this graph in, in red. And the, this internal borrowing that I was discussing earlier between the, the broker dealer and the, and the, and the, and the commercial bank, uh, the commercial bank within the bank holding company is shown in blue. So as you can see, especially in, 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 in during the COVID shock, there was some substitution. So the banks, the broker dealers borrowed more from the Fed rather, rather than uh, decreasing uh, or borrowing internally from the commercial bank and decreasing the reserves, probably because they wanted to maintain their liquidity. So there, there, there could be some type of substitution between the, this reserve training intermediation and funding provided, provided externally from, from, from the Fed. Uh, especially during uh, acute uh, circumstances like the COVID shock uh, in, in March. So with that, let me conclude. Uh, I think one of the conclusions or one of the implications of our paper is that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's in this uh, new environment, it's optimal to maintain uh, ample excess reserves to facilitate uh, liquidity provision by some of these uh, large global banks. Internals, uh, we also find that internal transfers between the broker dealer and the non broker dealer subsidiaries or bank holding companies are in, important. And this sort of uh, shows us this linkage between the traditional banking sector and the shadow banking sector that has been discussed uh, in, 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 in some in, in, in previous years. And uh, some uh, friction that could prevent this intermediation could lead po po potentially to. Uh, some decrease of intermediation or uh, or uh, increases in, in different spreads depending on how much uh, these banks can intervene in those particular markets when uh, uh, short dollar shortages uh, arise. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm happy to get your comments at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ricardo. Perfectly on time. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know if you want to write them on the chat or you can raise your hands. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat and I don't see any hands raised, but uh, um, I'm happy to uh, to ask myself a couple of questions. So one question that I had is, I was surprised by your uh, chart on uh, internal versus external funding at the, at the end of the quarter in the sense that um, if, perhaps it's more a clarifying question. So sure. it, it looks like... Um, it looks like for these banks, it's more expensive to uh, get internal funding than external funding. Otherwise, they will get internal funding in the first place rather than resorting to internal funding at just at the end of the quarter to, um, to uh, be compliant with regulation. So that was my first question. Perhaps I'm not, I'm not sure I understood well that graph. Mm -hmm. And the second question I had is uh, uh, regarding your conclusions on the uh, crucial uh, role of ample balance sheets and uh, access to the Fed balance sheet. Um, and I was wondering if you also have data on foreign banks, because you know, there are some foreign banks, Japanese banks have a huge role in uh, intermediate uh, to the Fed sheet. So let me, let me very quickly answer a uh, question one. So what we find is that <clears throat> in these funding shortages episodes, uh, borrowing from the repo market becomes really expensive. Mm -hmm. So what they do is basically they, they borrow internally from their commercial bank. So the commercial, what the commercial bank does is it, 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 it drains its reserves. So it has excess reserves, they train them and they use those funds or they, they use those funds that are, are reserves and they, they lend them to the broker dealer. So in, the no, in, in normal days, it's less expensive to go out and repo with external banks, but then at the end of the quarter, the it becomes expensive. that you showed makes it very very expensive and that they go internally exactly so so that's more or less what what happens now uh, on, on on your second question we do have uh, some data for for foreign banks uh, unfortunately for the wider set of banks we only have this information on a monthly basis 
we, we do have daily information for, for banks. But again, one of the problems we have is that we, we have information for the U.S. Uh, portion of these foreign banks. We don't have information for the whole consolidated entity. Oh, well. so, so, so that's why we, we, we don't... We, we, we use it for some tasks just to see whether they do the same or not. And we do find that they more or less do the same as the, as the U.S. banks. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have the whole consolidated identity. We only have the, the U.S. operations of this of these foreign banks, and so putting them in the same level, it's it's, it's misleading because we're right. only capturing a, a, a part of their operations. Good. Um, all right. I think we can move to uh, the second speaker. So I will give the floor to the um, paper on optimal monetary policy under dollar pricing by Constantine. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, you. I would like to thank organizers for this uh, wonderful session and for including our uh, paper in this program. And uh, this is joint work with Dmitry Mukin from Wisconsin Medicine. So one, uh, one of the classical questions in international macro is uh, what uh, monetary policy is optimal for an open economy. And the conventional wisdom is that uh, policymakers should focus on their domestic targets, such as uh, domestic uh, stabilizing domestic prices and leave all the external adjustment, the burden of external adjustment to all the system of fully flexible exchange rates. And yet in practice, uh, this prescription is here uh, rarely followed. So first of all, there is this so-called fear of floating. Uh, Ilzetsky, Reinhardt and Rogov classified all countries in the world according to the exchange rate regime. And they found that uh, most countries, uh, with the exception of Eurozone and some other exceptions, uh, in one way or another, tie their currency to the dollar. Not only this is in stark contrast to the system of fully flexible exchange rates, but it's also very asymmetric. So most countries in the world tie their currency specifically to the American dollar. Uh, besides that, there are many discussions about, uh, among policymakers, they, they often voice their concerns about potential negative spillovers from the US policy. For example, there was much discussion about rising risk premium in other countries after tapered, uh, tapered tantrum in the US. Or uh, there also was uh, uh, many concerns about aggregate demand spillovers due to currency wars between the US and uh, the rest of the world. So one way to, uh, to connect uh, this uh, prescription in theory and uh, what uh, policymakers actually do was based on the global dominance of the dollar in financial markets where many financial assets are denominated in the American, uh, in the US dollar. As was famously pointed out by Helen Ray, this global dominance of the dollar in finance can lead to the global financial cycle, where many countries will try to keep the exchange rates more stable relative to the dollar. And then this mechanism can lead to uh, the asymmetric spillovers similar to the ones we see in the data. This topic has been relatively well studied by now, but another growing literature has emphasized the dollar also plays an important dominant role in international trade, uh, where uh, firms set prices for their goods uh, in, uh, in dollar disproportionately more often than in other, currency, in other currencies. So Gita Gopinath in her Jackson Hole paper uh, has provided evidence where uh, most countries in the world for which we have data uh, set uh, prices for most of their goods in dollars, and this border prices remain sticky in dollars. So in our paper, we explore the implications of this global role of the dollar in international trade for the optimal policy. And specifically, we answer the following questions. Should countries uh, let their exchange rates freely flow, as was famously prescribed by Milton Friedman, or should instead they peg their currency to the US dollar, as we observe in the data? If the exchange rate policy cannot completely pr protect countries from uh, foreign shocks, could capital controls be used instead? And could they shield emerging markets from undesirable exchange rate effects? If not, is there a gains from international cooperation? Could, the, uh, could this cooperation protect from spillovers? If the global cooperation fails, is there a case for more local forms of cooperation, such as forming uh, currency areas? Should the Federal Reserve try to limit it, uh, its spillovers from the rest of the world uh, based on the self-interest when it doesn't care directly about other countries? Or instead, could they actually use these spillovers and benefit from generating them? That is, is there an exorbitant privilege from the dominant status of the dollar in international trade? To provide you more context, uh, 
uh, we start from a very standard New Keynesian open economy model, which we adjust by adding two key ingredients. First, as before, we assume that local firms use their own producer uh, currency when they set prices for their goods in local domestic markets. But now we assume that exporters use dollar in all the export, uh, for their prices in all the export markets. So this is consistent with the evidence provided by uh, Gita Gopinath. Second, we acknowledge the importance of distribution costs in uh, uh, international, in, in uh, importing goods. And the fact that uh, most international trade is in uh, is trade in intermediate goods. So we assume that uh, foreign goods are combined with local goods and services, and then the whole bundle is priced in local currency. Uh, these two taken together, these two facts allow us to uh, match key patterns of the exchange rate pass through. Because all the uh, export prices are sticking dollars, these border prices will move one to one with the exchange rate, so there will be a high exchange rate pass through into bo border prices. And even though uh, import prices are also set in dollars, when they're combined with local goods and services and the whole bundle is priced in local currency, uh, they will move, move much less with the, the retail prices of imported goods will, will move much less with the exchange rate and this will result in a low exchange rate pass through into retail prices of imported goods. And this actually matches well what we observe in the data. In a recent study, our Burstein and Line looked at the episode of sharp appreciation in Switzerland. So here, uh, a solid red line shows the sharp change in nominal exchange rate at the beginning of 2015. Green circles show the response of border prices and the solid black line shows the response of uh, retail prices of imported goods. And as you can see, border prices follow the nominal exchange rate to a much larger extent than uh, uh, retail prices of imported goods. So later I will show you that both these key features of the data will have striking applications for optimal policy. In the rest of the model, we try to be as general as, as we can. And uh, our main contribution is that we solve for the optimal non-cooperative policy. So in this analysis, analysis, we are both normative because we prescribe optimal policy and positive because we explain some patterns that we observe in the data. And to give you a brief preview of our main results, uh, uh, first we find that it is indeed optimal for uh, central banks to focus specifically on uh, stabilizing their domestic prices. But even though this policy sounds, sounds like an inward looking policy because it focuses on a domestic target, it is actually an outward looking policy because it implies a partial peg to the dollar. And if all countries peg their currencies to the dollar, they will move the US in their monetary policy, a situation which we call the global monetary cycle. Despite inefficient allocation due to foreign spillovers, we find that capital controls are ineffective against shielding, uh, in, in shielding uh, against these negative spillovers. So the capital controls are not a panacea against all foreign shocks. And finally, while all countries uh, win from international cooperation, the US loses. So this is a bad news for potential prospect for international cooperation in this question. So there are a lot of related studies. The most relevant for our paper are highlighted in red. And let me just briefly say that we contribute to this literature by considering much more general setup. So we are able to provide many new results, but also to extend old results and see what actually drives them. So now in just one slide, let me try to describe the basic features of our model. So we start with the textbook small open economy model by Gali Manacelli, where the world consists of a continuum of small open economies. And we assume the US is symmetric to all other countries in all respects, including its zero size, except for the special status of its currency in international trade. So we deliberately make this stark assumption to study and highlight the role of the uh, currency in trade alone without the additional benefits provided to the US by its size, by its role in financial markets or anything else. All the assumptions on household side are pretty standard. So there is uh, some demand uh, for products with home buyers, uh, household supply labor, and they trade in some financial assets. Our new assumptions come up on the firm side. There is constant return to scale production function that combines labor into inter intermediaries, intermediates. Uh, these intermediates could be both domestic and foreign. So foreign goods are used in production of domestic goods. And then there are nominal rigidities. So prices are sticky and there is a Rottenberg price setting uh, with the producer currency in local markets and with dollar in all the export markets. 
And in the rest of the model, we try to be as general as we can. We assume very, very general functional forms for utility and production. Uh, and we assume that there is arbitrary set of financial assets, which is traded in international asset markets. So we go all the way through uh, from financial autarky with no assets at all to complete markets for the full set of aerodebris securities and all the uh, options in, in between. We consider a rich set of shocks, both for, product, uh, for productivity, for preference, and financial shocks. And we uh, replace Rothenberg uh, pricing friction with Calvo pricing. We replace CS demand with Kimball demand. And we allow for different degrees of home bias among households, uh, domestic producers, and exporters. And then it is useful to start with a uh, small preliminary lemma. So in this setup, the flexible price equilibrium, when we exclude all the nominal rigidities, is first of all efficient from perspective, perspective of individual country in terms of non-cooperative policy. But it can also be impl implemented under producer, producer currency pricing by targeting uh, domestic prices. So this corresponds to the very first conventional wisdom that I showed you, that uh, kind of the main problem in the setup is the nominal rigidity. And in producer currency pricing, it could be completely over, overcame by this optimal policy that focuses on domestic targets, on, on domestic prices. Now let we me have move 50 on. minutes, 50 right. minutes left. Uh, let me move on to our results and start with the optimal monetary policy for non-US countries. And we find that it is indeed optimal for central banks in non-US countries to completely stabilize prices of their domestic producers. So first of all, uh, this is a very convenient result because it summarizes optimal policy with a simple sufficient statistic which is invariant to parameters or other details of the model. So we can allow for, we can change many different assumptions to the model and yet the optimal policy rule stays the same. Second, this uh, uh, target is formulated, it looks like, like it's formulated in terms of producer uh, price index. The central bank should, should to stabilize uh, this price index. But actually our model is flexible enough to allow all imported goods to come from distribution sector. So kind of um, uh, then the whole bundle of imported goods are sticking in local currencies. And these prices, so prices of all imported goods are also will be stabilized. So this could be, uh, this also could be reinterpreted as a consumer price index. And eventually when, uh, what, what this result tells us is that the optimal policy should target all the prices that stick in local currency and try to stabilize them. Next, this policy is time consistent and doesn't depend on any um, state variables, including uh, asset positions or uh, predetermined prices. The main part of this result is that the surprising part is that the optimal policy stays the same as under producer currency pricing, despite uh, that uh, it results in inefficient outcome. So before in producer currency pricing, uh, policymakers could achieve the first best allocation with this policy. So it was no surprise that this policy was optimal. But now allocation is not for first best and yet the policy is the same. So if we look closer into this, the source of inefficiency comes here from nominal rigidity, but specifically from terms of trade. Terms of trade is the relative price of imports to exports. Both of these prices are sticking in dollars, so they're just too little in equilibrium relative to its efficient value. But monetary policy can actually affect these terms of trade. Uh, so there is a trade-off. They can either set terms of trade at exactly the right level, or they completely stabilize domestic prices, or choose something in between. So in equilibrium, they choose to stabilize completely domestic prices. And the key insight into why is this so is that in equilibrium, conditional, optimal, stable domestic prices, exporters set their dollar prices efficiently. It means that if we give another policy instrument to the policymaker to choose directly dollar prices instead of private firms, they will choose exactly the same prices as private firms. Uh, that is to say, there is no other externality that the policymakers try to adjust. And this is very different. Um, th uh, this is very different from the uh, equilibrium under producing currency pricing, where uh, nominal exchange rate adjustment could effectually bypass the nominal rigidity and uh, simultaneously affect both uh, margins. And finally, our result and, and the optimal policy is robust to endogenous currency pricing. So in an extension, we allow firms to endogenously choose currency in which they set their prices and in which their prices will be sticky. And then we solve for the optimal policy, allow the policymaker to internalize the effect of policy on this currency choice. And we find that policy is still the same. So again, the intuition is precisely the same as before. 
conditional on stable domestic prices, private firms choose currency for, uh, for their prices in an efficient way. All right, now that we looked that, uh, uh, look at the optimal policy rule, which uh, completely stabilizes domestic prices, does it mean that the optimal policy is inward looking? It doesn't respond to foreign shock, for foreign shocks. It does not, as we found that if marginal disutility from labor is constant, then the optimal policy raises nominal interest rates when the currency depreciates against the dollar. So let's say for, for some external reasons, our uh, nominal exchange rate depreciates. This increases the border prices of imported goods because they're sticky in dollars. And because uh, we use uh, Im imported goods in our domestic production, this will put an upward uh, pressure on our marginal costs. To keep markups constant, firms would like to increase their own prices, and, and yet the optimal policy prescribes to keep them stable. So in order to uh, avoid uh, increasing prices, the optimal policy will raise the nominal interest rates. Right? So in, in this sense, if, let's say, a U.S. monetary shock happens, we uh, respond by increasing nominal interest rates. So first of all, we find that generically, policy is outward looking, except for a very special uh, case when there are no intermediates and when there is constant disutility for labor, which was the um, largely focus of the previous literature. And so this fact that most international trade is trade in intermediate goods already implies that the op uh, actual optimal policy will be outward looking. Second, uh, if higher rates appreciate exchange rate, this policy would imply partial peg to the dollar. So let's say US, uh, US appreciated, so increased its nominal interest rate. Our exchange rate depreciates, so we increase our nominal interest rates. If this leads to appreciation, it means we appreciate in response to US appreciating. So we follow the US in their optimal policy. And this actually contributes to this so-called fear of floating. And kind of the second ingredient of our model, the fact that most international prices are uh, sticky in dollars, leads to this asymmetry in the fear of floating. Right, so everybody wants to respond to U.S. monetary shocks, but not to some other countries' monetary shocks. Next, uh, if all countries respond to U.S. shocks, uh, this will constitute what we call the global monetary cycle, where the, uh, the whole world becomes more synchronized because every country follows the U.S. and their monetary policy. And our model will actually predict that there should be a higher pass-through in policy for countries with more dollar currency pricing. And indeed, this is what Tony Zhang found, uh, finds in his paper. So the right graph here shows how different countries respond to an increase in nominal interest rate in the U.S. Different countries respond differently, but the more they have dollar invest imports in their consumption bundle, the more they increase nominal interest rate in, in response to a given uh, increase in interest rates in the U.S. So this is very much consistent with uh, what we find. And finally, uh, this result can, can, uh, contributes to the trilemma dilemma uh, debate. Uh, so it, it is the case that uh, with fully flexible exchange rates, the first best allocation cannot be achieved. And in this, case, in this sense, the trade-off that policy makers uh, are facing is worse. So they cannot uh, achieve full adjustment for flexible exchange rates. But also it does not mean that exchange rates are useless and fixed exchange rate is not, is, uh, is not optimal, it is suboptimal. So exchange rate still is an important part of adjustment of country to external shocks, um, but uh, the trade-off is worse for policy makers. All right, so now that we have seen that uh, allocation is still suboptimal with optimal monetary policy, we can ask how much can we do better with additional policy instruments? And we start with capital controls. Um, specifically because there is conventional wisdom formulated here by Olivier Blanchard that emerging markets can shield their domestic economies from undesired uh, exchange rate effects through capital controls. Apart from that, this, uh, there is a very general result, result by Fari and Verning that if monetary policy cannot achieve first best, uh, the risk sharing is generically inefficient due to aggregate demand externality. So uh, in our case, monetary policy cannot achieve first best, uh, and it would imply that uh, indeed it is optimal to use capital controls. To answer this question, we add a full set of state contingent taxes in our policy problem. So essentially, we allow uh, the domestic planner to choose any risk-sharing arrangement subject to the country's budget constraint. And we find that capital controls are ineffective, and uh, the domestic planner does not use them at all in equilibrium. So this result is very surprising, and it seems to contradict the result by Farin Verney. To see what breaks down, 
we replicate the formula uh, from power inverting in our model and essentially the optimal tax on a specific asset in a specific state of the world could be represented as a weighted combination of two wedges. So in red, there are two wedges, domestic wedge and export wedge. Uh, when, so the optimal monetary policy, it, by stabilizing domestic price, by completely stabilizing domestic prices, it sets to zero domestic wedge, which intuitively means that the domestic quantity is optimal. But export wedge is open, export quantity is suboptimal the terms, uh, because terms of trade has not adjusted to, the, to, its optimal, uh, to its optimal value. Now, weights depend on blue objects, and blue objects are mar domestic marginal propensity to consume uh, certain goods. So the first blue objects, which is, uh, which is positive, shows that if we uh, increase income of domestic consumers, they will spend some of it on domestic goods. But because domestic goods uh, quantity is optimal, we don't use it. Now, the second marginal propensity to consume shows that if we give additional income to domestic consumers, they will spend nothing on uh, exported goods just by construction, right? So foreign consumers matter for our exported goods, not our domestic consumers. And because with domestic, uh, in a small open economy, with uh, domestic capital controls, we can affect only our income, but we cannot affect income of our trading part partners. It makes no sense to use capital controls. So the first ge uh, general uh, implication of this result is that capital controls are not a panacea against all kinds of foreign spillovers. So they're very useful with dealing with the global financial cycle, but they're not as useful with dealing in, uh, with global monetary cycle. And also uh, one corollary that follows uh, from this is that optimal cooperative capital controls are generically non-zero and target economies that import uh, goods with some optimal quantities. So if I cooperate with my trading partners, we will impose a tax on, uh, on income of, on my trading, uh, trading partners when my export quantity is suboptimal. All right, another policy instrument that can be used is trade, uh, trade all kind of uh, trade taxes and trade tariffs. Um, so we yeah. know... Uh -huh. Four minutes. All right, all right. So, uh, uh, generally, we know that fiscal policy can replicate effects of monetary depreciation. And also, in a specific case of local currency prices, fiscal policy can restore efficient allocation. And indeed, we find that uh, in our setup, the non-cooperative first best allocation can be implemented with three policy instruments. First, money, domestic monetary policy against stabilizing domestic prices, export tax, which will stabilize our export prices in domestic currency, and production subsidy to exporters, which will stabilize um, dollar prices of our exporters. So as before, the goal of the first instrument to set domestic quantity, right? The goal of the third instrument is to make sure that we don't, so that when dollar export prices stay constant, we don't pay any price adjustment costs, road empirical or Calva. And the second instrument makes sure that we bypass the nominal rigidity because we put an export tax on top of dollar prices, we can essentially achieve the optimal terms of trade uh, adjustment without any price adjusting costs. So again, this optimal policy is robust in terms of targets and doesn't depend on parameters and other details of the model. And uh, uh, it, it could be implemented with different instruments, but the export tax is important because it allows to uh, bypass this nominal rigidity and uh, as opposed to standard models, it's not as amorphic to the import tariff. All right, so now I have a couple of minutes left. We can talk a little bit about the optimal US monetary policy. How can it take advantage of this global status? So uh, this problem is much more complicated. So we're, for this section, we assume fully sticky prices and complete markets. And then we find the optimal US uh, policy rule and it, can, it combines the three distinct motives. The, th the first motive is the price targeting. Uh, so uh, it stabilizes, if it fully stabilizes the first term in this formula, the domestic quantity will be optimal and the export quantity will be optimal. So all domestic quantities of production will be optimal. The second term is the uh, terms of trade manipulation motive. So the US policy affects markups of all the world exporters because the US has uh, these negative spillovers. The US uh, internalizes it and in order to consume imports cheaper so that world exporters set their prices lower, there is incentive to US to adjust the policy to achieve lower import prices. And third, there is the so-called dynamic terms of trade manipulation motive. So it means that because the US can affect global output, it can affect global stochastic discount factor. 
and thus it, it, it can affect prices of financial assets. So it actually can manipulate its policies so that instead of the world where it's tried to borrow, it's cheaper for, it, uh, for the US to borrow. And instead of the world where it's tried to save, it can save at a higher rate. So uh, here the UF, uh, US behaves as if it's large, but it actually has zero size and uh, it's all due to status of its uh, dominant currency. And uh, this motive was largely absent in the previous literature that focused on a specific parameterization where net export was zero in all states of the world. So in general, we find that US can both benefit or lose uh, from dollar currency pricing relative to other countries. It can lose, for example, when it focuses mostly on the second motive. So only the US can affect world prices of global exporters, but all countries import the same bundle. So everybody benefits from actions from the US when it does so, but only US has to change its policy to achieve this kind of public good. So when it focuses too much on the second motive, it loses. But in a special case, when it focuses mostly on the first motive, for example, when the openness of all countries is small, so it doesn't care much about import prices, it strictly benefits because it can, at the same time, simultaneously, due to uh, status of its currency, set the domestic quantity right and the export quantity right. So I think I'm approaching the end of my time, so I will skip the result on cooperative policy and the uh, local currency areas, and I will just end with a brief summary of our main results. So these are more uh, are in our paper, and uh, I, I will gladly hear your questions. Uh, thanks very much. I just had a message for the, uh, for the audience. There is a Q&A, uh, there is a Q&A button at the end of the Zoom window. If you want to ask questions, you can use this Q&A uh, facility. Uh, while the uh, other speakers and uh, York as well, so the panelists can uh, raise their hands uh, or they can uh, um, ask questions directly by um, by just unmuting their uh, their microphone. Um, let me see if I see any any questions in the Q and A. There's nothing in the chat. I didn't see anything. Uh, one question I had um, on uh, your result. Of, well, I had one question, one comment. So one question I had on the result of your floating is if there is any, um, any um, um, any hint that this uh, fear of floating in your model could be uh, could be uh, asymmetric, so fear of appreciation rather than just fear of floating or moving against against the dollar. I saw a paper that in the Journal of International Economics that was making this point from an empirical point of view, and they found that uh, generally speaking, uh, countries don't want to appreciate against the dollar, but they have to appreciate against it. Uh, and then the other comment is that I think the, uh, the title of the paper is a bit restrictive in the sense that uh, you have a lot more than just optimal monetary policy, you have a whole bunch of uh, policies and uh, much more than that. So it's more well, general than, uh, than, than it looks from, yes. from, from, from I, the title. I, I'm very uh, and then I have another question yeah, from the audience. Uh, third question, is there any benefit from cooperation? And if so, how large is it? We have a question from uh, Daisuke Ikeda. So uh, let me start with the second question. I'm very happy you asked it because recently we changed the title to include optimal policy, much more general than optimal policy. Good. Because uh, money. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> and uh, then let me proceed to the third question. Is there any, uh, any benefits to local, uh, to local cooperation? Uh, so I did not have time for this per se, but it follows from capital controls, right? So as I said, if I could have a union of countries where we could uh, impose capital controls on each other, we could uh, make things better because I will increase uh, income of people who import my goods when my goods are suboptimally low, right? And so suppose we don't have capital controls, but we form a currency area uh, with the countries whose shocks are modestly correlated, but not perfectly correlated. So in this, in this case, we can also increase aggregate demand of my uh, trade partners uh, by, uh, by monetary policy. So suppose in the currency area, for many countries, exports are suboptimally low, then we can increase, uh, we can uh, decrease nominal interest rate and boost the aggregate demand uh, in order to uh, increase aggregate demand for everybody, including for countries that in, uh, trade in with these uh, depressed goods. So indeed, if, even if global cooperation fails, there are new sources of gains for forming local currency areas. 
And then uh, going back to your first question, so the way I understood it, could it be that the yeah, fear before of you ask, Before you ask my... Huh? Before you ask my question, I have another question from the audience that perhaps is, is uh, uh, more uh, interesting to, to the rest of the speakers and, uh, and uh, listeners. There's a question from uh, Giancarlo Corsetti. I will just read it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent do your results depend on distribution, quote unquote distribution, that is placing price rigidities at the level of the bundle of goods at consumer level? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we have an extension. I can uh, try to find it at one of the buttons where we allow for different uh, home bias in all three places. Uh, I think it's here. So we, will, we look at the uh, cable demand, but more importantly, we look at the heterogeneous home bias for final consumers, for domestic producers, and for domestic exporters. So all of them import uh, uh, foreign goods in different shares. And actually, we can set some of these home biases to zero. Right? So in this sense, our result is very robust. So when I was saying that all imports may come through production, we can uh, set home bias uh, to an extreme value for final consumers. So in this sense, again, it's, it's very robust to this uh, distribution the way I understood the question. Okay. I think uh, we have satisfied the audience and the questions that, uh, that, that were raised. And I think we can go to the uh, third paper. Let me thank you, Konstantin, for the... Thank you uh, very nice much. Presentation for C to the time. So the third presentation is by Maria Wereva from the European Central Bank, and the title of the paper is uh, "Risk and Certainty in Monetary Policy in a Global World." So the floor is yours, Maria. Perfect. Thank you so much for attending our session, and thank you so much to the organizers for having our paper on the program. The title is "Risk and Certainty in Monetary Policy in a Global World," and this is joint work with Gerd Becker from Columbia and Nancy Shu from Boston College. And I should say that the views expressed are solely our own. I think it's fair to say that there is a renewed interest in how monetary policy affects risk appetite um, across the globe, but also domestically. Uh, in our JME paper in 2013, we documented that in the US, US monetary policy affects domestic risk aversion in the stock market in that when US monetary policy is tight, risk aversion is high, and when US monetary policy is loose, risk aversion uh, in the domestic stock market is low. Now, this idea has sort of uh, more recently resurfaced in the international context, whereby Ellen Ray has written a series of papers where she emphasized the role of the US as a center country which drives global risk appetite. Now, not everybody may agree with the dominant role of the US. Here is an excerpt from a speech by Chairman Jerome Powell from 2018, where he says that while global factors play a role, uh, an important role in influencing domestic financial conditions, the role of US monetary policy is often exaggerated. So what do we do in this paper? Well, first of all, we're going to ask how do monetary policy shocks transmit across advanced economies through risk variables. And we are going to be interested in sort of two risk channels. One is the, let's call it loosely price of risk or our proxy for risk aversion. And the second is expected quantity of risk, which we will call uncertainty in the stock market. The second question we are going to ask is, do non-monetary policy driven risk shocks affect asset prices across advanced economies? So here the idea will be to compare the relative importance in monetary policy shocks and non-monetary policy driven risk shocks in driving asset prices across advanced economies. How we are going to address these questions, we are going to look at a high frequency daily basis. Our sample will be 2000 to 2015. And we are going to look at three advanced economies, United States, Euro area and Japan. What do we find? Well, with respect to the first question, how do monetary policy shocks transmit across advanced economies through risk variables, we find pretty weak evidence of monetary policy spillovers going through risk aversion or through uncertainty. By contrast, we find strong evidence for monetary policy spillovers going directly through interest rates. With respect to the second question, do non-monetary policy driven risk shocks affect asset prices across advanced economies? We do find strong spillovers of non-monetary policy driven risk shocks across all countries. That means that not just shocks emanating from the United States matter and spill over to other countries, 
but also risk shocks emanating from the euro area and from Japan affect asset prices in the other countries. And importantly, effects vary across asset classes, so it is important to consider them uh, separately. In terms of contribution, we take a less US-centric approach. So we do not assume that US is a sort of center country, so we allow spillovers to also go in the opposite direction. We look at the transmission of monetary policy versus pure, quote unquote, uh, risk shocks, so purified of the effects of monetary policy to various asset classes and our evidence is provided on a high frequency basis. So what I would like to do is to tell you first and foremost how we measure risk aversion and uncertainty because these are key ingredients into our analysis. Then I will focus on the main part of the paper which is sort of studying the transmission of monetary policy versus non-monetary policy driven risk shocks. And I hope at the end I'll have time to tell you about our new daily global risk aversion measures that we construct. So let me go to the measurement of risk aversion and uncertainty. How do we do that? Well, we rely here on options implied variances. So think of the VIX index for the US, the well-known fear index in the stock market for the S&P 500. Uh, we will take squared VIX, so option implied variance, not volatility. And we're going to decompose this object into two components. One is expected stock market variance, UC, uncertainty, Loosely speaking, it's the amount of risk investors are expected to be exposed to over the course of the next 22 trading days. And a second component, which is the difference between the squared VIX and uncertainty, which is sort of the price of risk, the compensation that investors demand for being exposed to the particular amount of risk. And that is reflective and is related to their risk attitudes. Now, what's the economic intuition more precisely Uncertainty, or what we call uncertainty, is something that uses physical probabilities of future states, uh, whereas VIX and VIX squared is derived under risk neutral distribution. So it uses risk adjusted, or if you will, marginal utility adjusted probabilities. So when we take the difference between the square and UC, what we have precisely is the expected premium from selling stock market variance in a swap contract. So it is again related to the compensation that investors demand for being exposed to a certain physical amount of risk. And that's why we view this as proxying and being informative about their risk preferences. We are not the first ones to use this decomposition or to in fact think of this particular uh, economics behind it. There are similar suggestions that were made in a paper by Ian Martin, but also my co-authors have a structural model that yields basically the exact same uh, intuition. So how do we do this practically, the decomposition? Well, what we need to do is to come up with an estimate of UC, of this expected stock market variance. The way we are going to do it, we are going to forecast future realized variances, and we are going to use models that have been used in the literature before and that have been shown to perform well in this forecast. But we will also use new forecasting models. In particular, our innovation here will be to allow for nonlinear relationships in the forecasting models. We think it's important because in our sample is the great financial crisis. Volatility was through the roof at times. And we think it is important to allow for nonlinearities in, in this relationship to capture the dynamics uh, of, uh, of these relationships in the forecast. So we run a horse race between linear and, and nonlinear models, and we pick basically the, the model that performs best in terms of its forecasting ability. And that's how we basically come up with the, the prediction for the expected stock market variance. And then we take the difference to obtain this price of risk or risk aversion measure. What data do we use? Very standard to get realized variances. We use five minute squared returns and we use the uh, implied volatility indices VIX for the US, VISTOX for the Euro area, VXJ for Japan, and we always use a local currency denomination. So this is what comes out as our decomposition. So you have here a panel of our three advanced economies, US in the top, Euro area in the middle, and Japan in the bottom. And in red is our risk aversion proxy, and black is our uncertainty measure. I think there are two takeaways here. First of all, these two measures can move quite a bit. Maybe it's not so surprising that risk aversion and uncertainty in the stock market are positively related. 
Uh, they correlated about 0.5 for the US, uh, about 0.3 for Japan, more so for the euro area. And they spike whenever there are basically some crisis episodes. You can see the, the uh, corporate scandals in 2003, of course, the global financial crisis. You see the beginning of the sovereign debt crisis in the euro area, the escalation in 20, 2012. Uh, and so on. So sort of the usual uh, suspects where these, um, where these uh, variables spike up. Now, let me go sort of to the main part of the paper uh, following this measurement um, part where we study the transmission of monetary policy and non-monetary policy driven shocks. So first of all, let me start with monetary policy impact and how do we assess it? Uh, we have an international setting, so we can look at the impact of monetary policy both directly within country and also at spillovers uh, across countries. And the way we are going to do it is in a very simple and uh, sort of standard way. We are going to look at the responses of various financial variables to monetary policy shocks and regressions with daily data. And on the left hand side, uh, you can think we have our risk aversion measure, first difference, or uncertainty measure in first differences. And on the right hand side, we have monetary policy shocks in the three areas, in the US, in the Euro area and in Japan. And we have a bunch of controls like event dummies, uh, but also macro news that are released in these various uh, countries. And of course, we have to take care of adjusting for the time zone so that left hand side variables react to variables that are actually in the information set. So if you think of Japan, it cannot react to things that will happen today in the euro area and the US because its markets will be closed. So those variables, for example, enter with the lag in the case of Japan. Uh, how do we measure monetary policy shocks? Very standard, we are going to take uh, high frequency changes in interest rate and basis points. Uh, as a baseline, we take three months interest rate futures or swap changes. Uh, following the well-known methodology of Wood Connect Second Swanson. We will also check uh, whether our results are robust for one month's uh, shocks. Uh, we will also look at the cleansed monetary policy shocks. And what I mean by that is that they're cleansed of central bank information shocks. Uh, and there we will use the, the shocks derived by my colleagues, Marek Erczynski and Peter Karadi. We will also look at monetary policy shocks that account for unconventional monetary policies. I will not be able to show you all the results uh, today, but for Japan, for example, we will be using uh, this measure of unconventional monetary policy shocks, which is based on high frequency changes in 10 year government bond futures, because in Japan, of course, already since 2000, the unconventional monetary policies were in place. And if you look at just changes in the short rates, they basically barely moved. So our uh, monetary policy shows for Japan will be used, uh, will be based on high frequency changes in 10 year government bond, uh, bond futures. 13 right. minutes, Maria, 13. Perfect, thank you. Um, so here's the first sort of set of results where we look at the impact of monetary policy shocks on domestic risk aversion. And so the question is, you know, does monetary policy affect domestic risk aversion? And what I'm going to show you is sort of two specifications out of many that we consider. So baseline where we measure monetary policy based on three months uh, futures or swaps. And a second specification where we decompose monetary policy shock into cleansed shocks and central bank information shocks. And here we have results for the US, for the Euro area and for Japan. Uh, and the results are somewhat disappointing, perhaps, in that we do not find evidence that uh, monetary policy affects domestic risk aversion. None of the coefficients are uh, statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, central bank information shocks in the euro area seem to play a role in the inspected, expected direction in that good news about the economy uh, uh, reduce risk aversion in the stock market. What about uncertainty? A bit of a similar picture. We don't have strong evidence that monetary policy affects domestic uncertainty. Uh, it, this does happen with cleansed monetary policy shocks for the euro area, but in all other specifications and countries, there is no statistically significant effect. So what do we do next? We would like to distinguish the impact of monetary policy shocks versus non-monetary policy driven risk shocks. How we will do that well, first we have to construct the risk shocks. And the way we are going to do that is again, very simple. 
uh, we will take the regression residuals of risk aversion or uncertainty uh, from these regressions we just saw. We were regressing the changes in risk aversion or uncertainty on monetary policy shocks and on macro shocks. By construction, these residuals are orthogonal to monetary policy shocks. And then we will study how the monetary policy shocks we've already seen, and now this non-monetary policy driven risk residuals, how do they transmit across our three countries? And we will look at different variables, risk aversion, uncertainty, but also interest rates, token bond returns, exchange rates, commodity prices, and gold prices. I will not show you all the results, but I will highlight some of the interesting findings. So here comes again our risk variable, risk aversion first, and the tables get a bit more uh, complicated because we now not just have monetary policy shocks measured in a baseline again by three months, uh, changes in three months futures, but also this decomposed monetary policy shocks. But we now also have the risk shocks in this case here, the orthogonalized residuals uh, for a risk aversion. And we show here the international spillovers. So from the US to the Euro area, from the US to Japan, Japanese vari variables, risk aversion in this case, and so on. Um, what do we find? Well, in terms of monetary policy spillovers, and that's highlighted in this table in yellow, uh, the evidence of spillovers to international risk aversion is pretty weak. In fact, the only significant coefficient is the one uh, from euro area to Japan, meaning that when euro area uh, cleanse monetary policy tightens, the uh, risk aversion in the Japanese stock market tends to go up. Okay? It's a, uh, again, something that would be consistent with our JME uh, findings when monetary policy tightens, risk aversion goes up, uh, but we find it here only uh, in terms of spillover from the euro area to Japan. What is strong is non-monetary policy risk aversion spillovers. So what we do find, and this is highlighted in this red coefficients where the, 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 the red ones are statistically significant ones, uh, we see that nearly from all countries, uh, there are spillovers to the other countries. Uh, and the pass-through is pretty strong of 10 uh, to 50%, okay? So risk aversion does spill over across countries, monetary policy, not so much. What about uncertainty? Um, bit of the same story, very weak evidence of monetary policy spillovers to international uh, uncertainty, um, but pretty strong evidence of non-monetary policy driven uncertainty spillovers from all countries. So again, not just the United States, uh, but your area to the US, your area to Japan, but also Japan to your area. Um, so, so far the takeaways are, first of all, monetary policy spillovers in our sample do not seem to operate through risk aversion uncertainty. And second, we do not see clear evidence that US is sort of the center country, the hegemon that is driving uh, risk and uncertainty in the other countries. Now, another obvious variable that is interesting to look at uh, is interest rates, right? So again, here I want to see uh, how the monetary policy shocks in the three countries and the risk shocks, risk aversion and uncertainty shocks in the three countries affect interest rates in the US, in Japan, and in the Euro area. Uh, the tables get even bigger, so let me go step by step. And I will show you first the impact of monetary policy on interest rates, and then of risk variables on interest rates. So here we go, here is the monetary policy spillover results. And what we see is the spillovers through interest rates are there uh, in the international arena. In particular, German interest rates, these are short-term three months rates, are strongly sensitive to international monetary policy shocks, both coming from the United States, that's this coefficient. So when the Fed raises rates by 10, when there is a shock uh, of 10 basis points, the, the German rates tend to go up by two basis points. And this is even stronger for, uh, for shocks emanating from Japan, where 10 basis point shock leads to 4.5 basis point increase in German rates. And we also find strong spillovers of euro area central bank information shocks, whereby sort of good news about euro area economy uh, leads to higher interest rates, both in the US and in Japan. What about the risk spillovers? Um, so here we are looking at non-monetary policy risk aversion and uncertainty shocks 
in the various countries and we see whether those from the US spill over to Germany, to Japan, from your area to US and so on. Um, we do find some spillovers through risk aversion to interest rates uh, from the US to the euro area, from the euro area to Japan. Uh, for, use, for your uncertainty, the results are relatively weak. Uh, in all cases, the coefficients are negative, which means when risk aversion and uncertainty go up, the short-term rates tend to go down. Well, this would be consistent with the precautionary savings channel. Uh, and this is what we find here, uh, both for uncertainty and for risk aversion. Now, another interesting variable you can think about is stock returns. Uh, and we know from the extent literature that monetary policy uh, shocks affect uh, stock markets. Um, so what do we see here? Again, I split the results between monetary policy channel and risk channel. Um, we do find significant monetary policy spillovers to stock returns in the other countries particularly when we use this yaruchinsky karadi decomposition into cleansed shocks and central bank information shocks. Uh, the cleansed monetary policy shocks spill over from the US and from the euro area. And again, like for the interest rates, we find strong euro area information shock spillovers. Now, the effects are, are economically pretty large. So, for example, in response to 10 basis points Euro area shock, which then spillovers both to the US and to Japan significantly, the US and Japanese stock markets drop by about 0.5%. So that's a relatively large uh, uh, magnitude uh, economically in terms of stock market effect. What about risk spillovers in the stock returns? Um, well, they are there uh, for both uh, uh, risk aversion and sometimes also for uncertainty. And again, it is sort of emanating from all countries. So there is no strong dominance of the United States and uh, Japan's stock market seems relatively more sensitive uh, to, uh, to these shocks. We also have results in the paper for bonds and exchange rates and gold and commodities, but I think uh, I will not have time to, to cover this. So I, I do encourage you to, to, to look at the paper if, uh, if you're interested. Uh, and instead, let me sort of, um, do uh, one more exercise um, from the paper here, which is uh, to show you a sort of daily global, global risk aversion measure that, that we derive. Um, yeah, you still, have, you still have four minutes. Perfect. It's exactly Quite a bit of time. Um, so what we do here is we, uh, we would like to um, create a global non-monetary policy driven, non-macro news driven measure of risk aversion. So we are looking for a global risk aversion measure, the common, common component in risk aversion, and we are going to derive it from this purified monetary policy purged and macro news purged risk aversion shocks. And the way we are going to do it, we are going to use the global latent factor model that also controls for time zone differences across the country. So that's going to be actually our identification to filter out sort of this common component. So the idea is sort of that there is a common factor in, in risk aversion, and this common factor gets updated in each of the stock market as they open uh, in, in different time zones. And that's how we then filter out this, this common component that can react to the developments in each of the, in each of the stock market um, uh, as they open throughout the day. And here is the plot of our measure, which is in, in the red dashed line here. Uh, you can see that it spikes up uh, in, the, in the global financial crisis. Um, what I also plot in this chart is the global financial cycle measures derived by Miranda, Agrippina and Ray. And I think two things were sort of striking to us. Uh, one is that these two measures are so highly correlated, they're, by the way, negatively correlated, which is to be expected. One is a risk aversion measure, and the other one is a more risk appetite measure. So we do expect them to be negatively correlated. They're about minus 0.8 correlated, so rather strong. And it is surprising for two reasons. One is we use completely different methodologies and very different asset prices to, to derive these measures. But maybe more interestingly, um, the Miranda, Agrippina, and Ray measure uh, they show is strongly driven by US monetary policy. Whereas our measure is explicitly purged of the influence of 
monetary policy shocks and of macro news announcements. So we did not expect ex ante that these two measures would be therefore highly correlated. So to us, it suggests that there are other factors, factors other than US monetary policy that drive both of these global risk aversion or risk appetite measures. Let me conclude. In terms of contribution, we took sort of less US centric approach and we focused on high frequency evidence. Um, we tried to distinguish the impact of monetary policy shocks from non-monetary policy driven risk shocks and we looked at different asset classes. This is sort of a brief summary of what we find. For risk aversion, we did not find strong monetary policy spillovers. Instead, we found that it's risk aversion shocks that spill over to other countries. For uncertainty, similarly, no monetary policy effects, but uncertainty shocks spill over across countries. For interest rates, by contrast, we do find strong monetary policy spillovers and some spillovers also through risk aversion and uncertainty shocks, which are not related to monetary policy. Um, and we also have some effects, particularly strong actually for forgotten commodities of, uh, of uncertainty shocks in this case. And uh, I think one interesting finding is that the monetary policy and, and risk spillovers we find are stronger for stocks than for bonds. This is, by the way, consistent with the idea that stock markets could move much more uh, than, than bond markets. So as a sort of takeaway, uh, again, in our sample and with our high frequency analysis, the asset price movements across countries do not seem to operate through the US monetary policy affecting risk aversion link. And in that sense, again, in our sample, US monetary policy role as a sort of center country uh, does appear to be exaggerated, as uh, Chairman Powell put it uh, in his speech. Um, there is a bunch of robustness checks we do in the paper, but one thing in particular is still on our to-do list, which is that we want to do more dynamic analysis in terms of uh, understanding the persistence of some of the effects we, uh, we uncovered. Let me stop here. Uh, happy to take questions and happy if you also email me with any feedback you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. I, I again ask people that have questions to, uh, to write them in the Q&A uh, session or uh, part of the, Zoom, of the Zoom window. And we do have one question. I will uh, read it to you. Can you relate your findings to the empirical literature following Bernanke and Kuttner, which finds that most of the stock market movements in response to US monetary policy are driven by news about future excess returns? That's question number one. Do we have any other questions? Let me see if somebody's uh, raising hands or uh, doing other things. Uh, I don't see anything else. Uh, I have uh, um, a couple of questions myself. Um, well, perhaps more comments than question. Uh, my comment would be that uh, when um, when you compare your results to the Miranda Grippino uh, paper, there's I think two things that we need to keep in mind. One is that when they claim that their measure is strongly affected by monetary policy, what they're looking at really is is input response function. So we don't know exactly the portion of you know the variance of this stuff that is actually being uh, moved by monetary policy. So it's perfectly in a sense, compatible with the fact that uh, it's very much correlated with your measure in the sense that there are other shocks that, that for sure affect both your measure and, uh, and their measure. Um, and the other thing about this relationship is that their, uh, their measures, their measures is the first moment of, of stock prices because they look at stock returns while you look at the, you look at the variance in a sense. So they are related by their, of course, uh, to different, to different uh, animals and uh, um, they're going to respond also differently to, to various shocks. The floor is yours again. Perfect, thank you. So thank you for the, for the question. So on Bernanke, Kuttner, and it's a very good question, right? They were sort of the, the, the first to document the strong uh, US monetary policy effects on the stock market. And in, indeed, in their paper, they conjecture that one of the channels through which this uh, strong effect may come through is actually through risk premium. And you can think of our work and also our previous JME work is kind of trying to zoom in on this particular risk premium channel because what we look at ultimately our risk aversion measure is the variance risk premium. So you know you can you can think of it as sort of testing if you will uh, this particular channel of transmission of the monetary policy shocks to the stock market and we do sh show that um, there are these uh, th there are these um, 
effects of the risk premium, although in our JME paper, uh, where we did have a different sample, uh, we found uh, sort of uh, stronger effects of monetary policy on US risk premium than we find in this sample. So this, uh, this has to be said. And of course, uh, you know, we also here in this paper show that it's also the variation in risk, which is not related to monetary policy that also affects uh, also affects stock uh, stock market. So that's sort of an additional piece of uh, of that puzzle, if you will. Um, on the question about uh, the sort of rel sort of the effect of monetary policy uh, in in the impulse responses, and indeed that it is uh, not probably the only game in time because we don't know exactly how much monetary policy. Uh, matters, I, I completely agree with that, with that point. In fact, in our JME, we did a variance decomposition and we showed that monetary policy does affect risk appetite in the US, but it explains about 15 to 20% of the variance. Now, this is not little, but it's certainly not the only game in town. There is 80% that is driven by other factors. And this was one of the reasons why we wanted to also look at the risk shocks, which seem to matter on their own quite a bit, we do find that the impact is more than twice as strong as the impact of monetary policy. So that's precisely what drove our, uh, our analysis is to say, yes, monetary policy sometimes has an effect. Um, uh, it does, doesn't seem to go just from the US to the other countries, but also the other way around. Uh, but it is not the only game in town. That's precisely, precisely the point. And I, and I take your point that the, the, the measure by Miranda Agrippino and Ray is very, very different. And that's why I think it's so interesting that they, they, they look so similar. Uh, although again, as you said, they look at, at, at the different, uh, you know, the first moments, they look at very different, they look at the very large set of asset prices. And we basically just take the, you know, the VIX and realized variances and, and some forecasting model in, 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 the, in the back. But both uh, Miranda Agrippino's measure and ours is highly correlated to this implied uh, volatility at the end. And that's sort of what you see, uh, what you see there as well. So I completely, uh, I completely agree uh, with your points. Thank you. I was talking to myself. Uh, now I am using myself. I want to thank you for keeping to the time, and uh, I think we're doing very well for the paper. So we can move to the session, which is capital flows deflection by uh, under the magnifying glass by Etienne from the OECD. Sorry, Etienne, I didn't uh, spell again. I didn't say again your surname because I got it wrong. I think the first time. So. Uh, Le Père. <laughs> Le Père, fantastic. Uh, yeah. So you have 25 minutes. Thanks. The floor is yours. So hello, everyone, and thanks for, um, for inviting uh, us to, to this uh, very interesting session. Thanks to uh, uh, Fabrizio and, and Yorgo. The paper is entitled Capital Flow Deflection Under the Magnifying Glass and is a joint work with Filippo Gori from the OECD and Caroline Mohegan from the Central Bank uh, of Ireland. Uh, they may be in the attending the session and so they should uh, be welcome to jump in and help me answer the, the, the questions. So the views in the presentations are, are, are ours and should not be attributed to the OECD or the Central Bank uh, of, uh, of Ireland. So quick, uh, quick slides on the motivations for this paper. Um, it's no surprise that uh, we live in an increasingly financially interconnected world. And I'm plotting here cross-border portfolio debt positions as, a, as an example. This is the network of uh, cross-border portfolio debt flows uh, in 2005, and this is in 2017. The nodes have increased, the network has uh, densified, and uh, the number of linkages has, uh, has increased. So what does it imply in terms of policy spillovers, which is uh, the objective of this paper, is that if one of the economy in this network is taking a particular policy, then you should see some spillovers through the linkages to, uh, to other economies. So domestic economies, um, domestic economic policies in one country may be the source of international spillovers through financial trade channel. So you have a large literature on the spillovers of US and EU monetary policy that we just heard from the previous paper. And you have an emerging literature on the spillovers of macro proof. So what is our paper uh, about is about the capital flow spillovers from the introduction or tightening of capital control. Why is it important is that uh, this has been much more used uh, following the global financial crisis. So you see in that graph that uh, you have a rising number of countries that have tightened capital account policy since 2008. Uh, and this is why you may expect uh, some more spillovers 
from, from such policies. To give you a few examples of the capital controls that we're talking about, uh, Brazil in 2009 uh, introduced a tax on FX inflows, the IOF. Iceland introduced a special reserve requirement on debt inflows in 2016. I can quote Peru that uh, uses reserve requirements on bank non-residence liabilities. Turkey prohibited uh, for residents to obtain FX credits from abroad. And Australia introduced stamp duty for foreign buyers of real estate. So these are very different countries, very different measures, and they're all coded as a tightening of, uh, of capital controls on inflow in our data set. So what, why, what would these policies have as a, as a consequence in terms of capital flow deflection? If you have country A that invests in country B, but country B puts up a capital control, so country A investors cannot invest anymore in country B, and so the capital flows are deflected into country C. So that's what you see in the, in the, in the stylized scheme at the, at the bottom left. And this has been shown to, to fit the data. So this is the flows, portfolio debt inflows to Brazil and portfolio debt inflows to Mexico. And you see that uh, after the introduction of capital controls in Brazil, the flows are shifting to, uh, to Mexico. You see after each of the black bars, the flows are, uh, are increasing in Mexico. So that's capital flow deflections. What do we contribute in the, in the literature? Um, seminal papers by Forms and Lambert have made a country specific studies on the Brazilian IOF, which I just mentioned to you before. And Jordani, Gosh, and Cheruti try to extend it in cross-country settings. So they use annual data and they use aggregate capital account uh, openness indices. A very welcome study that came afterwards is from Pastricia, 2018, that uses aggregate quarterly data and aggregate capital control adjustments. So instead of having slow moving capital controls indices, uh, she codes adjustments in capital controls. So what do we do in our paper? The paper leverages on two new data sets. So a new quarterly granular data set of capital control adjustments and a new bilateral capital flow data set that captures FDI, equity, debt, and, and loans. We do three things. We first test whether all capital controls, all capital flows are deflected alike and due to which type of control. We control for the investing countries and test whether emerging markets or advanced economies investors react differently. And finally, we test for a capital control domino effect and whether investors anticipate it. So a few words on the data. Uh, our capital control data was first presented in, a, in, a, in previous work in 2019. We code 2,300 adjustments of capital controls for 51 economies from 2000 to 2017. What's the big difference with previous uh, capital control indices before? One of the most used uh, index uh, is the Fernandez et al 2015 index, which coded as one if an operation is restricted and zero otherwise. So the operation is fully free. What we do is that we code as plus one if a restriction is introduced, plus one if a restriction is tightened, minus one if a restriction is eased, and minus one if a restriction is, is removed. So instead of looking at the stock, of the, uh, the, the overall openness in the economy, we look at the changes in capital account policy. That's to give you an example of the differences between the two measures. The yellow line is the Fernandez index, uh, which for the case of India, and shows that overall in the last 20 years, there has been, been much changes in capital account openness in India. Uh, the country remains closed and is in between the 0.9 and, and one, um, of the, of the index that you can see on the right hand side. Our measure is the gray line, which actually shows a very regular and gradual easing of capital account policies throughout uh, the last 15 years. And we actually code in our data set more than 140 uh, instances of easing actions in, in, in India during, during that period. So to give the contrast between the two, very complementary uh, uh, indices, but showing that you need to go a bit more into the intensity of the measures to be able to see that there was actually easing movements uh, in, in India at that time. So what's our baseline model? Uh, we have capital flow. We are tr trying to estimate capital inflows as a percentage of GDP, as a factor of lag capital inflows, a spillover variable, which is the impact of capital control 
in similar countries on capital inflows, capital controls in that country, and uh, and traditional and traditional uh, controls for for capital flows. We use country fixed effects, and we focus on major EMEs: Brazil, Chile, China, Colombia, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Poland, Russia, South Africa, Thailand, and Turkey. And the model is run from 2000. Uh, Q1 to 2017 Q, Q4. So how do we define our spillover variable? How do you define similar economies? Uh, it could be through region, it could be through risk, through return. In this paper, we define similarity on the basis of the correlation of capital inflows. That's to say, countries that are similar uh, for international investors tend to direct uh, investment to both countries at the same time. So the spillover variable is a weighted sum of CFMs in similar economies, where the weights represent the correlation between flows to the domestic economies and flows to the partners. So it shows whether the capital flows to A and capital flows to B are correlated. That's the pairwise uh, correlation uh, of inflow matrix. And the results in our baseline is that if you look at the, the, the blue arrows, the spillover variable, if the coefficient is positive and significant, it means that the countries that is similar to the country introducing controls is receiving more inflows. And you see indeed that at the first lag, the second lag, the third lag, and not the fourth lag, you have a positive and significant coefficient. So that means that capital is deflected to similar borrowing economies following the introduction or the tightening of inflow controls and you have a persistence of the effect that is over a, a year time. So now we leverage on the granularity of our data set to be able to see whether the type of control matters and whether the type of flows matters. So we take the same baseline and this is just the cropped uh, regression tables and we look at whether different types of controls deflect capital differently. So you have here the spillover variables for FDI controls, for portfolio equity controls, portfolio debt controls and credit controls. You see that only portfolio and other investment uh, flows are deflected. And this is only through the controls that are controls on portfolio equity, controls on portfolio debt and credit. The fact that you can match the type of flows that is deflected with the type of control that is introduced is a strong, uh, is a strong uh, conclusion for, for our story that it, this is actually deflected capital from the from controls. We're seeking to extend uh, this very quickly through volatility spillovers. We ask whether this volume deflection that we see is also, uh, is also true in terms of volatility of capital flows. We use the same equation using the four quarter standard deviation of capital inflow as a dependent variable. And again, positive and significant results. The robustness checks, um, broadly robust to other global controls, year fixed effects, and different spillover variables. So instead of having the time varying inflow correlation, we use risk return uh, weights, we use assets and liability weights, and we're making our inflow correlation non-time varying. And the results are, are robust. So now we shift to a different question, and it is which are the investors that are actually deflecting capital? So you need to shift to a bilateral perspective. You still have uh, 14 minutes. Okay, excellent. So where is the deflected capital coming from? You have different countries that are involved to varying degrees in different asset classes. And the global financial system has significantly evolved over the past decade, with notably a much more stronger footprint of EME. So we have the same model, but now it's a bilateral model, where you have bilateral flow logged on the left-hand side, the spillover variable, and now you can control for capital controls on the receiving side and capital controls from the sending side. So capital controls on outflow. And you have country per fixed effects. We use this new bilateral capital flow data set from the European Commission Joint Research Center uh, that allows us to have annual data on bilateral flow by, uh, by, by countries. We reproduce the same type of, uh, of regressions. And we show that when the country, the source country sample is EME, and the destination country sample is EME. This is only bank flows that are deflected after the introduction of capital controls in similar economies. When it's advanced economies investors that we are looking at, advanced economies investors redirect both portfolio and other flows. Again, matching flows and controls, 
you see that the bank flows for advanced economies uh, are dropping, uh, are losing significance, but that the results on EME banks and on advanced economy equity investors are, re remains uh, positive and significant. How do we explain the fact that these are different flows depending on whether the investor is from EME or from advanced economies? Well, we look at the growing importance of EME, EME banking. And in fact, uh, that's again, network charts where you can see that the linkages have increased much more. And they now represent 42% of banking flows to EMEs are from other EMEs. Uh, a few examples of uh, e uh, emerging market banks that uh, are very active internationally. So what we've seen is that we've, we have some evidence of capital flow deflection on the aggregate. It's only portfolio flows and banking flows that are deflected and this type of controls that deflect capital. It's only emerging market banks that are um, deflecting capital and it's only advanced economy equity investors that are deflecting capital from our bilateral setting. And now in the third part of the paper, we look at whether you have responses to these spillovers. So first we look at policy response, a reaction to spillover, and we ask whether countries receiving spillovers responds by tightening in turn their capital account policy. So the traditional questions. Uh, Patricia, uh, the Patricia paper found that yes, while Jordani didn't find any effect of policy spillovers there. So we uh, change our model. Now we have a probit model where our uh, dependent variable is the probability of, um, of tightening CFM in this quarter or the next as a function of uh, CFM in similar economies and the same controls. And what you see is that countries tend to react to capital controls in similar borrowing economies by tightening their capital account in turn. The three last columns are whether they tighten equity controls, bond controls, or credit controls. And you see that the equity control is not tightened following the tightening of, uh, of capital controls in other economies, but the bond controls and the credit controls are tightened. And finally, in, a, in this final part of the paper, we ask whether international investors anticipate this potential domino effect. And they would incorporate this expectation when redirecting the flows. So we use an endogenous treatment model to decompose capital flow deflections into the direct spillover effect, which is the portfolio recomposition, which we have identified in the first, in the aggregate and in the bilateral model and an effect originating from the expectation of a tightening in the domestic economy. So you have now capital inflows as a function of the spillover variable and the probability of the expected probability of uh, CFM tightening. So you have the effect due to expected CFM tightening and the direct deflection effect, where this probability of CFM tightening is treated endogenously and estimated with a treatment equation very similar to the domino equation that we, that, we just, uh, that we just showed. So this endogenous treatment effect were mostly used in the, in the literature on finance growth and, uh, and financial fragility. And what do we find? The first step is uh, the right hand column and the second stage is the estimated with maximum likelihood is the, is the first column. And you see that you have both a positive coefficient on the direct deflection effect and a positive coefficient from the expected probability of tightening CFM. So you see that you have both the normal deflection effect that we had, that we had seen in the, in the previous models, but also an effect due to expected CFM tightening. What does it mean? It means that international investors seem to front load their investments to the spillover receiving countries, expecting a CFM tightening. Wrapping up, some of the key results. So, you do have capital flow deflections, but this capital flow deflection differs by flow type. It's only portfolio and other investments that are deflected and they differ by investor origin. So you have emerging economies banks that redirect flows and advanced economies investors that redirect portfolio and other investments. You have both a policy reaction and a market reaction to these spillovers. The policy reaction is that countries targeted by deflected capital tend to respond by introducing themselves CFMs in turn. And the market reaction is that international investors respond to these expectations, front loading their inflows in new destination countries. So the policy implication is uh, again, the potential role for international cooperation 
international cooperation on capital account policy may be necessary to curb uh, this possible realization of particularly negative endgame and result in better uh, global outcome, discussed by Blanchard, Rajan, uh, Jeanne, and, and, and others. So here, potential value of multilateral framework for capital flow management and dialogue platforms like the, like the one that we have at the OECD on the capital uh, movement scope. So thank you, and the paper was recently released as a as OECD working paper, so you can find in the link uh, to have more details on the specifications and the, and the results. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Etienne, for your presentation. Now, one question I had is on this, uh, on this, uh, re on this result that you have uh, uh, that countries that are targeted by capital flows uh, control react by uh, targeting themselves. And I was wondering whether this is really a bilateral uh, reaction rather than just a reaction to uh, global shocks. So, you know, there is uh, a global flow liquidity to which everybody reacts by, uh, in a sense, targeting capital, capital controls not to import uh, too, much, uh, too much capital. So if there is a way to distinguish this, for example, with the common factors or something like that. Um, and yeah, so that's the only question that came to my mind uh, while listening to, the, to your presentation. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. And in fact, I mean, we don't look into factors and into common factors, and that's something we could, uh, we, we could, we could do. In the regressions, you have the, the global variables that are, uh, that, are, that are entered the regression as controls. So that should uh, actually drive the potential of, uh, of, CFM, of CFM tightening. And in fact, when you look at the determinants of whether a country will tighten or not uh, capital control, you see very, very, a uh, few variables that are significant. So it's very, very hard to, to kind of predict, to have policy rules uh, of, uh, of capital control uh, actions. And in fact, in all our first stage and in our domino model, we don't find any variable, including capital inflows to the country that are, uh, that are a strong predictor of the, of the, of the tightening of, uh, of capital control. So that's a surprising result for, for all the literature. Uh, and this is consistent with other researchers that didn't find also any evidence for uh, the fact that you, when you have a boom in inflows or a boom in outflows, you react by, uh, by putting outflow or, uh, or inflow control. So the fact that we find some significance there on the, on the CFM tightening fact means that there are some, some policy comparison there into how you set up a capital account policy and uh, and not necessarily obvious uh, macro variable. Okay, thanks for your presentation. Uh, wait, there is something popping up in the Q&A. Uh, Piros Kanagi Mohaxi um, writes, very interesting presentation. Thanks, at the end question. How do you explain the dominant effect of similar country policy responses? What are the incentives to do so? So that's a that's very, very related question. Um, this could be political economy explanation. So um, you, have, uh, you may have some stigma in using capital controls. And so if uh, one particular economy starts to put up capital controls and you actually see some inflows coming into your, coming into your, uh, to your economy, you are actually doing the same. And uh, if the policy is, uh, is more or less acceptable, then you would do, you would do, something, uh, you would do something similar. So the incentive there are to kind of uh, uh, kill the bubble, kill the surge. But uh, on the other hand, um, it's helpful that previous economies have, have done so before. Okay, thanks. I I think we are at the end of the uh, of the session. Uh, we managed to uh, keep it uh, under uh, two hours exactly. I wanted to thank all the panelists for your presentations. Uh, again, uh, it's a pity that we didn't manage to meet this year, but let's hope that uh, we'll go back to um, in-person meetings at uh, some point in the, in the near future. Thanks to Sibra for hosting uh, uh, our, um, our session. Thanks to Yorgo for contributing very strongly to putting up the, to put to get the, the program and uh, to all the participants and to the ones that asked questions. So I am, uh, I'm now closing the session. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, you. It, was, it was good for you as it was good for me. Thanks again. I hope to see you all soon. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.